The temperament is basically, it's a bodily disposition which we have, and a bodily disposition is the arrangement that our, the matter in our body has. And this arrangement of the matter from one individual differs from one individual to another, but they tend to be categorizable under different, um, four different groups. But this disposition of the matter determines how well your soul is able to operate through the bodily faculty. So if you'll recall, there are different kinds of faculties in the soul. There's some that are purely spiritual, like part of the intellect, not all of it, but part of the intellect is, uh, operates completely independently of a bodily organ. The will it operates completely independently of a bodily organ, so there's no bodily organ. They say, well, there's the will, you know, type of thing. And then there's some that work within a, um, a composite between the spiritual component and the physical component, so like sight and things of this sort. So if the disposition or the arrangement of the matter in my eye isn't good, then I can't see very well. But some people have really good dispositions, like in their brain and that type of thing, and so their level of understanding is higher. The temperament, so it's the temperament is this bodily arrangement. It's principally uh, hereditary or natural endowment, although environmental factors can also affect disposition or temperament. Now, what that means is, you know, if you eat certain things, um, you know, you don't feel as good, and so that affects how the, the matter is arranged or the disposition of the matter in your body, and so you, it's harder to be good or, um, uh, you know, to stay away from certain kinds of foods when you're not feeling well, that type of thing. Each temperament, therefore, because it affects the um, how we... Um, how we act, how the soul acts through it, will also incline or affect our inclinations towards different kinds of virtues and vices. And we'll see this as we start going along. You know, for instance, people who are sanguine have a uh, greater problem with uh, vices that pertain to the sixth commandment, whereas um, the people who are cleric have a problem more with anger and things of that sort. Your temperament is changeable. You can actually change your disposition of your matter, your temperament. Um, so, for example, somebody will um, work a great deal on overcoming the defects of a sanguine temperament, and then as, the, as they go along, they start realizing they're starting to take on the disposition that's more choleric, and so they have to work on those things. But there is a general principle that the body um, adjusts itself to the operations of the soul. And so that means that the body begins to arrange the matter to a certain degree. Obviously, some of this, it's all done within a certain set of limitations, but the body begins to adjust itself um, so that it can more easily accomplish the uh, activities of the soul. And this means then it, you can actually change your temperament over time. Now, of the four temperaments, there's, there's the four temperaments. The goal is to reach a state in which one is capable of performing all the functions easily of the, all the temperaments while not being inclined to any of the defects of the temperaments. That's what Christ had. Christ, um, properly speaking, did not have a temperament in the sense of the four that we're going to talk about today. His was, because his bodily body was so subjugated by virtue, it actually, um, and he didn't have any defects arising from original sin because he didn't have original sin, then it meant that the, body, the matter in his body was arranged to operate, to, to allow the soul to operate perfectly through it. In fact, one of the things that people can kind of see is if you start fasting, you start noticing that, you know, your, your, your um, touch becomes more sensitive and things like that. Um, and so Christ, because his body was so perfectly subordinated by virtue, the arrangement of the matter was such that he could feel pain more acutely. He could feel um, pleasure more acutely as well, but he could feel the pain more acutely, which is why his suffering and carrying the cross and things of this sort during his passion are far more intense than something that we would normally go through. But as people advance in virtue, and we've talked about this, when you reach the state of sanctified perfection, and you have the soul is adored with all of the virtues, it means that the temper, none of the four temperaments predominate, and that a person actually doesn't have a temperament in the proper sense anymore. Well, this will make more sense as we go along. Most people develop their moral lives and their spiritual lives based upon the temperament because it's easy. As we'll see, there are certain virtues that are easy for the sanguine individual or the melancholic individual to develop, but there's other ones that are much more difficult. And very often, people who are of one particular temperament will 
develop those virtues, but they won't. But they'll develop vices in the areas that are they're more inclined towards, and things like that. Or they won't develop those virtues as easily. Um, and then there is, lastly, before we actually get into the temperaments, there's what we call a predominant and a recessive temperament. There's one temperament that people tend to, that tends to dominate. Now, it's almost impossible for a person to be a pure sanguine, although I did know a guy that was pretty close to a pure sanguine. Usually people have a predominant one, like they're sanguine with a little bit of choleric, or they might be phlegmatic with a bit of melancholy or something of that sort. So there's, they have a, usually there's a mix if you go, as we're going through these, it's a good practice to, to figure out which temperaments did you have, the predominant and recessive one, because that will tell you the things you need to work on in your spiritual life. And it'll also be good for an examination. You know, am I working in these areas? Have I worked in these areas? Do I have problems in these areas? So that if you know your disposition, you'll also know where your weaknesses are very often. And so it can be very useful in the spiritual life, which is why the spiritual writers talk about them. Okay, the first is the sanguine disposition. And the sanguine disposition uh, is it's the one in which people react quickly and strongly. So their reaction is quick. They react very quickly. And it's very strong. But it's not permanent. It doesn't last very long. So it's also short. And you see this. You know, the sanguine guy, you know... His wife might say something, and so he blows his lid, but then five seconds later he kind of calms down because he doesn't really like anger that much anyway. And then five minutes later he's calmed down, and he's just peaceful, and he's completely forgot about it, that type of thing. He, the reaction tends to last only for a short period. He tends to be lighthearted, imaginative, vivacious, joyful, optimistic and hopeful. So it tends to be rather positive on that side of things. Now, if you recall, I talk about there's two different kinds of appetites. I'm talking about sensitive appetites. And these sensitive appetites basically have what we call passions. So the sensitive appetite is the faculty which has the ability to undergo a passion. And passion is another name for emotion. And of the emotions, there's... Um, ones that are categorized based upon the fact that they're part of the concupiscible appetite. And this appetite is the thing which um, inclines towards things like, um, uh, just on a sensitive level, sensitive love. So, for example, somebody who really likes steak, that's a sensitive love. You know, If you find steak very pleasing to you, if you like steak and that type of thing, well, that's a sign that you have a certain um, sensible love for the thing, which is different from intellective love, which is the real love to people that's important. But this concupiscible appetite engages in things like love, desire, so things like lust are activities of the concupiscible appetite, um, delight, that type of thing. And then, and so the sanguine person is the one who tends to um, have predominant the activities of the concupiscible appetite that are positive. Now, there's also some negatives because you, the concupiscible appetite also has hatred and aversion and um, also sorrow that it, it can suffer. But this, the sanguine disposition is one who has the positive. So he's the person who tends to be rather desirous. He, likes, he, he really likes eating good food. He often suffers from problems of lust and things of this sort. The positive traits are... He's friendly or affable. Actually, let me back up. And then the the other uh, appetite is called the irascible appetite. And this is the one that comes from the Latin word ira, which means anger. And it's the one in which the, 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 the person becomes angry. But it's also the one in which aggression and things like that operate through it. Um, there's uh, five of them that actually operate in here. But the, in the irascible appetite, And we'll see this when we get to the melancholic. They predominate in operations of the irascible appetite. So the sanguine is the one. It's these, the positive traits of the concupiscible appetite. Okay, so he tends to be someone who's emotionally very positive. 
You know, he tends not to be the depressed individual. He tends to be upbeat and that type of thing. So his positive traits are friendly or affable. He tends to be pleasant. People really like being around sanguine people because they they tend to be um, create a pleasant company, I and mean, you want to you enjoy being around them. They are agreeable, and they tend to be more loving, generally speaking. They're compassionate towards those who suffer, so they, they tend to have a heart of gold. They're very soft. They have a soft spot for people who, are, um, who suffer or go through difficulties. They tend to be docile. In other words, you can, you, they're easy to lead because they're willing to you know, follow you because they can, might see that it's good or whatever. They're candid, so they tend not to beat around the bush, or they tend not to be um, fraudulent and deceitful, but they rather tend to be just out in front. It's what you see is what you get, is a sanguine individual. They're sincere and spontaneous. They're cheerful and at times have a contagious enthusiasm. So in other words, they can get around people, they're laughing and carrying on, everyone kind of gets sucked into it type of thing. They react strongly to injuries, but they quickly forget them. And they recover from offenses, and they tend not to hold any rancor or obdurate. They're not obdurate in evil. In other words, they don't. They tend not to be vindictive. They tend not to be, um, you know, trying to see how they can get after somebody and cause trouble for them. That's just not because for them, it's too wearisome and too tiresome to go through all that effort to achieve those things. They would rather just blow their stack and then just move on with life. They tend to be extroverts, so they're kind of out there all the time, you know. They tend to be the people that, you know, go from individual to individual and tend to, you know, talk a lot and things like that. There are negative traits of the sanguine disposition. They tend to be superficial. Um, And part of that is because they're kind of wrapped up... The the sanguine people tend to be kind of wrapped up in, in, in the pleasurable things in life, and that tends to make them a bit superficial. Whereas they're not the type, the same disposition, it's hard for them to acquire a virtue of mortification. It's really difficult for them, and so they tend to be um, rather superficial because, as um, Fulton Sheen says, maturity tends to come through suffering and responsibility, but they tend to be neither. And that's something that they have generally often have to fight. So they tend to be superficial, unstable. Why? Because their emotional life is always changing. They tend to follow their appetites, um, and so wherever their <laughs> wherever their appetite tends to be going, that's where they tend to go. So you know, the, there's an upshot to this. You know, if a wife has a husband who's very sanguine, if he gets emotional or irritated with something, just prevent him, present him with good food. And then he'll just kind of calm down and be chipper or you love up on him a little bit. And then he's happy as a camper. So this is, uh, this is the happy camper. So this is the thing that you, this is the way, which if you know how people are disposed, you can understand a little bit about how they function. So instability and inconstancy. Now the inc- what inconstancy is, is when he thinks, you know, this is the right thing to do. You know, I've got to stay away from chocolate. Because every time I, you know, eat chocolate, I have this, you know, I end up eating too much of it type of thing. Well, then he gets around and so he says, okay, I'm going to stay away from chocolate. Then he gets around the chocolate and he's like, oh, okay. You know, he backs up and the next thing you know, pop, 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 he's wolfing down on the chocolate. So he knows he's supposed to stay away from it, but he still does it anyway. So he's inconstant. He tends to be hasty in judgment. So he tends to be somewhat imprudent because he won't um, take the time to deliberate what's the best thing to do in this particular case. He dislikes the re- reflection and the contemplative life. This is part of the whole superficial problem. So the people who are sanguine have a harder time developing a prayer life, generally speaking. And so they find it very arduous. It tends to not bring them any repetitive satisfaction very often, especially in the beginning stages. And so they tend not to want to engage in it. They're loquacious. They tend to talk a lot. And they dislike being alone. They dislike loneliness. So, um, and the part of that again goes back to the beautiful appetite. They, they take delight in being around other people, and so they'll go around seeking people's company. They're also the type of people that uh, once they kind of attach to you and start talking, they're kind of hard to get your distance from them because they just, you know, they keep talking. So, uh, and that's, sometimes that's good, especially if you're tired and you want to be entertained. It has its place. But a lot of times, you don't want to. They tend to suffer from vanity. They also are very easily succumb to flattery because it brings them a certain delight and 
um, an emotional delight, and so they so tend to succumb to it. Uh, and they sometimes suffer from envy because they see somebody else enjoying some good that they would like to have and that type of thing. Their predominant faults, so the predominant faults that they tend to have are sensuality, so they are prone to things like lust and gluttony. They tend to eat a lot, they tend to excessively, they tend to have difficulties remaining chaste, that type of thing. They're ready to undertake things, to undertake anything, but they quickly are discouraged. So they'll try things, but they don't, they don't, they're not really good at, they're not the type of individual you want to put in charge of a project that's going to be long and arduous because of the fact that they'll, in the end, they'll probably end up just giving up or trying to find an easy route rather than doing it right and that type of thing. They rely on their feelings in matters of religion, and that can be a big problem. Now, we're going to talk more about this when we get to the stage in the dem- uh, in demons, which I'm going to actually start, I'm going to do that in the next class. I'm going to, they're going to do two classes on demonic influence because they, it's very important for people to understand how they affect our spiritual life. But the first part will be just on how demons influence us. The second part will be on how you overcome and avoid that influence. But what, ha- what the moral of the story is, is that demons can move anything that pertains to our body. And now because the concupiscible and rap- irascible appetites tend to operate through a bodily organ, they can inflame these appetites. So if people tend to base their judgment or think, like the same people do, based upon how they feel, it's very easy to lead them along, the demons to lead them along, because they just have to present them with the right things in their imagination to get certain passions flowing, and so it's very easy to manipulate them. And so this is something that they really have to fight against. And in the matters of religion, that becomes a particularly difficult issue because we've talked about already that, you know, sometimes in, uh, in the spiritual life, one of the first things that God does is he strips you of the sensible consolations. Now, these sensible consolations are some things, things that are um, experienced sometimes even that can keep us a appetite. So what happens is, is that if a person starts basing their spiritual life on how they feel, they won't engage in things that are difficult. They won't do mortification. They won't do prayer because it's going to be too difficult. And um, they'll also be, they'll easily succumb to um, demonic influence. And this is one of the reasons why they have to really work on subduing their appetites and their fa- uh, their um, emotions. So I know the moral of the story is if you're emotional, you're just going to be easy, easy prey for the demons. They should be encouraged. So there's certain. So those are the predominant defects. So we have to encourage them to develop obedience since they are docile by nature. In other words, it's easier for people who are sanguine to be obedient. And that is a real something that's really good because they can actually develop um, a, se- a level of self-denial, at least on the level of the will, based upon that. They should develop their, chill, their cheerfulness and their candor. And they should be encouraged to develop certain virtues, but they should be encouraged to develop certain virtues contrary to their disposition. And we're going to do that with each of the temperaments. So there are certain things they should be encouraged to do, certain things that they should be to- told, you know, you've got to go this other way here. So one of the things they need to work on is temperance. Now, temperance is a virtue that is in the concupiscible appetite that keeps it refrained. In other words, it keeps it from you know, inclining towards the food, inclining towards things that pertain to the sixth and ninth commandments and things of that sort. So they need to develop temperance, and that comes through fasting and abstinence. That's the principal way that it does. They have to develop modesty and chastity, because that will tend to refrain them from being too... Because uh, people who are sanguine very often tend to not have... They tend to kind of blurt things out without reflecting on what they're saying and that type of thing, and so the modesty will refrain that. They should work on detachment. Now, detachment, we're back to this concupiscible appetite. The concupiscible appetite, when it has a love for a thing, now how do you know you have a love for a thing? Well, it's something that you like. So, for example, if you like steak, or if you like um, certain kinds of cheese, or if you like certain things, you actually have an attachment to these things. Now, not all attachments are necessarily evil. Some of them are according to our nature, and they're actually a good thing. Um, but they're not necessarily any attachment other to anything other than God is an imperfection. It's not necessarily bad in the sense of it being sinful or that it's intrinsically unnatural, but it's something that um, has to be perfected. Now, what this means is, is that St. Thomas says that all the other emotions flow from love. And what he means by that is, is that if you have, like if you have a child that you're really fond of, 
what happens is, so some, you know, and and he's playing soccer, right? And then some kid comes over and body checks him, boom, and knocks him down, right? Well, from the love, you could, the person perceives some injury to the thing that you love, and that perception of injury causes sorrow. And then, in addition, then the person thinks, oh, well, get backed up and go over and run him over, is the next thing. So then from that arises a desire for vindication. The combination of sorrow and vindication is what we call anger. And so anger arises out of this love that the person has, and that's why John of the Cross and many of the spiritual writers say, that you have to actually work on becoming perfectly detached, which means that your concupiscible appetite doesn't incline unless reason says this is what you want to do. So that in point of fact, it actually has no attachments to one thing or another. And that's very difficult for people to achieve. It takes a high level of virtue, but as you start gaining chastity and abstinence and virtue and things of, and, uh, and fast, the virtue of fasting and things of that sort, the concupiscible appetite begins to become detached from things and it becomes much easier. So they have to work on detachment and then that way they won't be so, uh, they won't base their religion on their emotions, they won't be um, superficial and things of that sort. They have to be encouraged to develop the virtue of silence because they tend to talk too much. Prayer and reflection, which will help them to overcome their tendency to hasty judgment and a lack of circumspection. Now, circumspection is the virtue in which you keep track of your surroundings and your circumstances. St. Thomas says that circumstances is immediately corrupted by emotion. And you see this. As soon as a person gets angry, they lose track of the fact that they're standing in the, uh, the checkout at Walmart and they blow their lid you know, in front of their wife or at their children or something of that sort. And so this is they, um, they tend to lose the track of their surroundings. And so... Um, the same with people who tend to be tend to follow their emotions tend to really suffer from incircumspection. They don't. They they tend to say things without seeing the proper context and things of that sort. And so they, if they start developing silence, prayer, and reflection, this will help them to be more circumspect, and it will also moderate their extroversion. Now, extroversion can be a good thing, but it can also be to excess, and so it has to be reframed. They must practice daily mortification of the senses, or they have to get in the habit of always doing self-denial and things that are physically difficult. They have to practice cuss to the eyes, ears, tongue, and sense of touch. In other words, they have to guard against... They have to basically develop the virtue of custody of the senses, or custody of the eyes is sometimes what it's called. They can't let anything come into their senses, which will have a mortifying effect, but they have to do that in order so that they're not so easily moved because the things that come into our senses tend to inflame our emotions as well. They have to guard against overindulging in exquisite foods and drinks. They should follow a regimen of life. They should get up in the morning and be disciplined. Okay, at this time I'm going to do this. I'm going to get up in the morning. I'm going to say my prayers until such and such a time. Then I'll have something to eat. Then I'll go to work, that type of thing. That structure will help them to be less prone to inconstancy in their life where they're you know, not doing what they should or they didn't do it at the right time or that type of thing. They should engage consistently in self-denial and they should persevere at their work and observance of order in their life. So sometimes saying when people, you go into their house and, you know, it looks like a bomb went off because everything is everywhere. There's no order. Okay, the next one is the choleric. The choleric disposition is someone who t- reacts quickly, but his reaction remains a long time. And it tends to be strong. He tends to have rather strong passions, and he, it's hallmarked by a proneness to anger. So his tends to be a negative passion in relationship to the irascible appetite. That is, he's prone to anger. You know, those are people that just very easily become angered by things. He's prone to despair because things just don't seem to go the way he wants. He tends to react favorably to reason and high ideals. In other words, they tend to be more, somewhat more intelligent people. St. Thomas said, not always. I mean, you can have somebody who's concupiscible and be a genius. I mean, I've seen that too. But very often, the people who are irascible tend to have, um, um, tend to be a bit smarter, generally speaking. And part of that, St. Thomas says, is because it takes, in order for to engage in the irascible appetite, you have to assess things a bit more. And what he means by that is to become angry, you have to make a judgment about, hey, something bad is going on here. And then there has to be consideration of vindication. So there's a more intellect, it's more akin to reason, he says. The, the emotion is more like reason than just, you know, the brute animal wanting, you know, wanting food and that type of thing. 
So, but the point being is, is that they tend to be they tend to be inspired or tend to be easily encouraged to follow the, uh, high ideals and reasons. So, they're, they're the type of individual who will sit down and they'll they're not interested in following. You know, they're not interested in eating the food. They're more interested in okay, how do we solve this problem? And they they like to think things through. They tend to be practical, however, rather than theoretical. Whereas my experience is, is that the sanguine and the, the other two temperaments, the melancholy and the, uh, the phlegmatic, tend to be uh, more theoretical rather than practical. And so, but whereas the choleric individual tends to be much more practical. He, and I have a friend of mine that's very choleric, and he is exactly that. He's very practical. He's, he's capable of intellectual reflection, but he, in the end, he's not really that interested in it. He just really wants to know you know, how do I, how do we get this done type of thing. He, but he is also more inclined to work than to think. He's really more interested in getting things done than just sitting around thinking of how you're going to do it. Inactivity is repugnant to them, so they tend to be hard workers as a general rule. So the positive traits are they have a keen intellect with great powers of concentration and endurance. So they can go, if something requires a lot of effort to think through, they'll, they're in for the long haul. So they have high ideals and a strong will. They're constant, so they remain fixed on something. They're willing to, they can go the distance. And they also tend to be generous, and they're also capable leaders. They're very good at leading people, although they have to be careful because sometimes they can be a bit harsh on the people underneath them if they don't achieve what they're hoping that they achieve. Um, whereas the sanguine people, when they get into positions of authority, they can be capable leaders on an intellectual level, and they, they can be good at trying to persuade people to do certain things, but they're not very good at you know, disciplining people when it's necessary or you know, cutting people off when it's necessary. They can tend to suffer a bit from human respect more, whereas the people who are cleric, they rarely have problems with human respect. Or if they do, it's not, it's not as strong. The negative traits are there's a certain stubbornness or obstinacy and impatience, they tend to, tend to suffer from pride. They tend to be rather proud people. And so they're very sensitive to humiliations. Whereas the sanguine person, very often, you, <laughs> it doesn't matter what you say, you can't really insult them that much. I mean, they're just, they're just not interested in taking offense, usually. So it doesn't matter what you say. They'll just not like, huh, what's up with him? You know, and then that's it. Choleric people tend to be domineering. They're characterized by a certain hardness, and they tend to look down on their fellow man to a certain degree. To his mind, others are ignorant, weak, and unskilled. They're slow, at least compared to himself. He shows, him, he shows his contempt of his neighbor by despising, mocking, or belittling remarks about others, and by his proud behavior towards those around him, especially towards those who are subject to him. He often falls into the lower vices, such as deceit and hypocrisy. He tends to lack compassion and sympathy for his fellow man. He should be encouraged to develop the virtues of fortitude because he's capable of developing fortitude much more easily than, say, the sanguine individual. Magnanimity, in other words, because he, he's inspired by noble ideas and things that tend to be rational, he very easily can strive for a greatness of soul because these are according to his disposition. Contrary to his disposition, he should be encouraged to develop humility. And that's going to be hard in the common form. And it's something that's going to be, um, each time he's humiliated, he's going to be very sensitive. But humility, humility is one of those things, as you begin to develop it, the humiliations tend to bother you less, and you get to a certain point where the humiliations actually bring you a certain joy because you realize, okay, I'm gaining virtue through the process, and that type of thing. But in the beginning, it's going to be hard for the person who is choleric he should develop meekness. Now, meekness is the virtue opposite of anger. And so he needs to work on not... Re meekness is the virtue in which you don't go to um, extreme in your reactions. And it tends to refrain the anger. But what this means is, is that the person becomes meek. The irascible appetite will begin to kind of calm down as time goes on. He should develop kindness and charity. He should try to moderate and direct his goals according to the order of charity. In other words, he should seek what's best for other people rather than just the satisfaction of achieving some goal. And this, was, this is also important because when he gets into a position of authority, he has to govern according to charity rather than his inclination to want to just, you know, you know be the guy on top of the, the uh, carriage, you know, 
hitting the, or snapping the whip at everybody. So he has to kind of come down and consider people's limitations and things of that sort so that he himself doesn't get angry. He has to encourage to depend on God and humbly beg him for his assistance rather than himself because his tendency is to depend on himself rather than on God. He is likely to make the lives of those around him bitter and difficult, and he should be encouraged to meditate on the sufferings of others, particularly those he, the, the sufferings that he's causing. In other words, sometimes they're unreflected at the fact because their focus is on achieving some goal or achieving something or getting something um, or venting their anger that they're not really thinking about, you know, you're hurting the person that's closest to you or something of that sort. He should meditate on the sufferings of Christ and how he bore them patiently and without acrimony. Um, Being angry with someone who is choleric only exacerbates the anger of the choleric. So you don't, when you're around choleric people, it's better to be meek and to keep rational rational around them because then they'll respond to that on a rational level rather than themselves reacting with anger. Okay. The next is the melancholic. And the melancholic is someone who has a disposition towards sorrow. Now, if you remember, you have... Love, desire, and love, desire, and delight. Love, desire is that you actually want something. You don't have it. Now, like is a little bit different. Like is just, do you like chocolate? Yeah, I like chocolate. So if you bring somebody who's just gorged himself on a Thanksgiving meal and you say, do you like chocolate? Yeah, I like chocolate. Do you want chocolate? Not right now. Okay, so there, that's the difference between the love and the desire. You tend to just like it, but that doesn't necessarily mean you want it here and now. Whereas desire is, I want the thing here and now. Delight is when you actually have a thing present to you. So when you actually get the thing, you know, you start eating it, and you get not just a physical pleasure, but you get kind of an emotional delight out of just, you know, woofing down on the, uh, the turkey, etc. The opposite of love is hatred, and this is just a dislike, you know. Do you like broccoli? If you ask George Bush, do you like broccoli? No, I just like broccoli. (laughs) Then there's the the opposite of desire is aversion. means the person turns away from it. He doesn't want it. He doesn't want it. He wants to get away from it. And then the opposite of delight is sorrow. Now, the the melancholic person is the one who has has a negative inclination regarding a concupiscible appetite towards sorrow. Sorrow is the presence of some evil to the individual. Delight is the presence of some good to them. Desire is the the, the future good, whereas delight is the good is actually present to you. The sorrow, or as a version is, you see something coming down the street, and I go, I've got to get away from that individual. The way you go, so you you turn away from that. Whereas sorrow is the the guy actually all of a sudden pops out, hey, how you doing? You're like... So the, the sorrow is when the evil is actually present to you. And so the melancholic is a person who is easily disposed towards sorrowing. So they tend to be the people who tend to um, be very pessimistic. They're always looking at the negative side of things. You know, the glass is always half empty. You know, what are we going to do when it gets empty? You know, that type of thing. They tend to di- desire delights in order to expel their sorrow. Melancholics react slowly. So they have slow to reaction but for a very long time, and it tends to be rather strong or deeply felt. And they, so their reaction tends to be permanent to what they experience. They tend not to forget easily. So if you do something that causes them any pain, they remember it later and that type of thing. They have a tenderness and a generosity for their friends, but they do not feel home in a crowd. And usually what that means is they tend to have a few close friends, whereas the same individual tends to have a lot of friends but tend to be somewhat superficial. The choleric individual tends to have a moderate number of friends, but they tend to, he tends to have a few really close ones, but a moderate number of other ones. The melancholic individual tends to have only just a few close friends and everyone else he really doesn't want to deal with that much. He's passive and not vivacious, quick or progressive. In other words, he tends to not react. He tends to react quickly to the injuries that occurred to him, but he tends not to do too much in form of going out there and trying to get things done and that type of thing. His positive traits, however, are that he tends to be contemplative, that he's very pensive, he tends to think things over a lot, he tends to mull things over, um, and he's inclined towards reflection. So we'll see this later, it's easy for him to develop the virtue of prayer. Yeah, he tends towards reflection, piety in the interior life, 
He's sympathetic and compassionate. He's also long-suffering. In other words, he can, he can endure things for a long period of time, even though he has a fear of suffering and a dread of interior exertion and self-denial. Even though he kind of has an aversion towards these things, nevertheless, when he's in the middle of the suffering, he can go the distance regarding it. The negative traits is he tends to surrender easily, though, and are, uh, to the, in dealing with things and achieving goals. He tends to surrender easily, and he tends to be over ser- overly serious. So you don't see them laughing too much. He tends not to laugh, whereas the sanguine individual tends to laugh at just about everything. Because laughing gives us a certain pleasure. Well, he's interested in bodily delights and things that are pleasurable, so he'll, he'll laugh at anything, and he, he tends to laugh and laugh and laugh. The choleric person laughs at stuff that tends to be intellectual, and they tend not to laugh too much at things that are, you know, appetitive or emotional. Uh, the melancholic, though, tends not to laugh much at all. So, but if he does, it tends to be more along the lines of some of the things that are more intellectual. He's reserved, except with close friends, since he finds it difficult to reveal himself. He's irresolute and dreamy, and he tends to concentrate excessively on himself. And that is the nature of sorrow. And one of the things about depression, and this is the thing I tell people, look, the reason you're depressed is because you're self-absorbed. Now what happens is, is people will say things like, oh, I'm depressed, I have a low self-esteem. No, it's the exact opposite. You overestimate yourself and how wonderful you are and the fact that not everybody else sees that and that's why you're depressed. So if you quit thinking about yourself and get your mind off yourself, you won't be depressed as easily. Okay. So, uh, in fact, depression and sorrow tend to have their, not all sorrow, but disordered sorrow, tends to have its root in pride. That sounds counterintuitive to everything the modern psychologists are telling you, but in point in fact, that's exactly what it is. So usually, if you can, t- if you, you know, if you hand the guy the litany of humility, and he starts saying the litany of humility, which usually causes him a, s- a significant amount of pain, within a few days, he's already feeling better. And then he wonders why. Well, that's part of it. Okay. He tends to be suspicious, and he tends towards scrupulosity, despondency, and pusillanimity. He's very much afraid of disgrace and humiliation. And the personalities arise from melancholy tend to be complex. In other words, he's the sanguine individual is very simple. Food or sex, you got his attention. Whereas the melancholy guy, you're going to have to do more than that to get his attention. He tends, and he also tends to be, uh, you know, because he analyzes things in relationship to how he feels and that type of thing, he tends to be much more complicated in his relationships and things of that sort. The choleric individual is not complicated at all. You know, do what I tell you, we'll both be happy type of thing. All right. So his predominant faults are sorrow, excessive sorrow, fear, aversion, despondency, and despair. So he very easily despairs. So you have to encourage him to develop certain virtues in accord with his disposition. That is, you can help him to have him to, to develop a spirit of prayer and detachment. Because they can develop a certain, it's easy for them to develop detachments and a spirit of mercy. So they tend to be very compassionate people and that type of thing. They're the type of guy you put in charge of Catholic social services type of thing. All right. Although you have to make sure he doesn't go to excess in that regard. Although contrary to disposition, he has to develop a joyous attitude, and that's going to cause pain. Now, that brings up a very interesting point. When the faculty is disposed, the disposition determines how well we relate to a specific object. So, for example, if the person is uh, very sanguine, he has a very sanguine disposition, and the object is food, the concupiscible appetite just very easily moves towards wanting food. But if the disposition is not very well disposed, it doesn't relate well to the food, then the faculty isn't that inclined towards the food. So that if a person isn't, you know, he doesn't really, um, if he doesn't feel well, or if he doesn't want, to, or if he's just not the individual that likes food that much, then when he eats the food, it doesn't bring him pleasure. In fact, it can bring him pain. And you actually see this in relationship to the to the melancholic individual, if you try and be joyful around them, 
he just gets very negative because it's causing him pain. But this is true of any disposition. In relationship to the sanguine, if, because he's really disposed towards eating a lot of food, if he doesn't eat the food, it causes him pain. Or if you deny him the food or things of that sort, it causes him a certain amount of pain. Uh, the choleric individual, if he's irascible, that is, he's inclined towards anger. If you're meek and you tend to be kind and that type of thing around him, it drives him nuts, causes him pain. Now, what this means is, is that this can give us kind of an indicator. You know, if you find that certain things, like if people say things that are um, stupid that really annoys you, it's probably means you've got a bit of cleric. Or if you if you find that certain things, you know, like if people tend to be uh, vivacious and enthusiastic and you don't like being around them, it's probably a sign that you're melancholic. And so, or you have a touch of it at least. So these are the things you can see, you can find out what your dispositions are, but if you recall, the virtue... When you act, perform an act of virtue, as you gain a certain amount of virtue, now the virtue, the virtue is in the spiritual side or the immaterial side of our faculties, whereas the disposition is in the material side. But as you begin developing the amount of virtue, the body again adjusts itself on the material side to the operations of the soul. So you can find out what your virtues and vices are based upon how you react bodily to certain things. And this is something that can be quite useful and quite important. Um, but as you become more virtuous, of course, the disposition arranges itself so that the faculty can easily move either for or against the food. You know, can either incline towards it or not incline towards it. And that's what virtue is. Virtue gives you certain powers so you can either do it or not do it. Whereas vice, you have a hard time not doing it. And that's one of the signs of it. But this is something that's quite important. So if you find that just that on a dispositional side, something just grates with you, you know, whenever you see it, that's a sign that you probably have a bit of choleric or something of that sort. So he has to, do, but, so he has to develop a joyous attitude. It's going to be painful, but that's what he has to do. He has to develop fortitude because of the fact that he doesn't want to do things that are going to cause him suffering. And doing those things that are arduous, which is what fortitude is, deals with, causes a certain level of suffering. He has to develop charity and hope, because the charity will, and hope, the hope will help him overcome the depression. You know, oh, I'm not going to get anywhere with this, or the despair. But the charity will drag him out of himself. Because charity is love of God and no, love of neighbor for the sake of God. So it's all about God and not himself. And so as he works on charity, he'll stop being so mel uh, melancholic and so sorrowful and depressed. He should be encouraged to bu be busy about beneficial activities such as work and hobbies in order to keep his mind off his sorrow. Okay. The next one is the phlegmatic. And that's the last one. This disposition is hallmarked by a certain placidity or tranquility or quiet. So this is the guy who reacts slowly, not strongly, so there's a weak reaction, reacts slowly and not permanently to their experiences and they are devoid of strong passions. You just don't get any reaction out of them. So it's not strong, so it's, it's not weak, but it doesn't last long, so it's short. The reaction is short. They work slowly, as this guy did, but assiduously. In other words, they're very constant and they just keep working at it. They're not easily irritated by insults or misfortunes or sickness. They tend to remain tranquil and discreet and sober. They have a great deal of common sense and mental balance because they don't, they're not affected by their emotions very much. So they tend to be capable of you know, judging things rather clearly on a practical level. They do not possess the inflammable passions of the sanguine temperament, nor the deep passions of the melancholic temperament, or the ardent passions of the choleric temperament. Their speech, in their speech, they are orderly, clear, positive, and measured. So they're very, they're, they're good at speaking because they can, you know, they don't tend to go to extremes and react and say certain things that don't belong and that type of thing. Rather than, and they're not very flo uh, florid or flowery or picturesque in their, um, in their, descriptions. They have good hearts, but at times they can seem kind of cold because they just don't react. You know. They would sacrifice to the point of heroism if it's necessary, but they lack enthusiasm and spontaneity. They tend to be prudent, sensible, reflective, and work with a measured pace. They attain their goals without fanfare or violence because they usually avoid difficulties rather than attacking them. 
Physically, phlegmatics are usually of robust build, so they're usually, you know, pretty good size, and that's the way this guy was. They are slow in movements and they're possessing an amiable face. I don't know why that is. This guy's face is somewhat amiable, I guess. Um, they considered passive, and they can be in constant principally because they don't have a strong passion inclining them towards remaining constant, but usually when it comes to work, they're still assiduous. They still keep with it. They tend to demand little, and they get along with others due to a lack of convictions. They're inclined towards ease ease and comfort, and they tend to be unambitious, procrastinators, and disinterested. Um, My experience also is that there was an author who made the observation that phlegmatic people really like food. And I know a guy that's very phlegmatic. He admits, I mean, all of these uh, characteristics, he's got most of them. And, uh, but I'll tell you what, he'll sit and just, you know, the food is the whole thing. And if it just doesn't quite reach his standards, he's, you know, there's a comment made, oh, this isn't quite this, and this isn't quite that, you know, and that type of thing. So that's one of the signs of a phlegmatic that's really interested in food. The predominant faults of phlegmatics are dullness and sloth. So in other words, they tend to be a bit inert. They just sit there and doing much. They should develop the virtues of patience and affability and perseverance, which are in accord with their dispositions. And contrary to the dispositions, they should develop zeal and temperance um, because they tend to really like food, so they have to temper their um, irascible appetite. They can overcome the negative tendencies of the disposition by deep convictions. Now, to become a saint, the easiest disposition to become a saint is the sanguine. But they are also the least likely to achieve it. And this is why. The sanguine people have a hard time overcoming the initial difficulties in achieving sanctity. So they tend to not get off the ground much because they're too wrapped up in the, in the pleasures of food and those types of things. Um, whereas the melancholic will very often be pensive, so they have kind of a certain start, but they don't get very far. And the cleric person will apply himself, and if he can overcome his anger, he can go very rapidly. But the phlegmatic disposition, because there's not much to motivate him, very often these people have the hardest time becoming a saint, the phlegmatic people. Whereas the sanguine people, it's much easier for them to become a saint. Again, it's a matter of predominant recessive, so you know, a lot of people will have a bit of sanguine, with a bit of choleric. Um, they might be phlegmatic, maybe with a bit of uh, melancholic or something of that sort. Sometimes you see people who are sanguine with a bit of melancholic because even though they're kind of vivacious, they can also be easily depressed if something doesn't quite work out and that type of thing. Again, all these are very important because they tend to affect our development of virtue and they tend to either impede or help us in the advance of spiritual life. Again, the, the, with the sanguine, which deals with the wrath, the concupiscible appetite, and then the uh, melancholic here at the bottom. And then you have the, um, the choleric and the phlegmatic, which doesn't react to much of anything. The goal is here at the middle. And the point about this is, is that the body, you should get to the point where the disposition, the virtue is such that it's easy, it's very easy to be constant and assiduous. It's easy to be, um, an extra verb in time requires it, but it has to be moderated. It's easy to do all those things that pertain to optimism and hopefulness and joy and charity and things like that. But at the same time, it's not the negative side where it tends to be to excess. And so the goal is, and this is what people will find, is they're advancing in the spiritual life, like let's just take the sanguine as an example. What they'll tend to find is, is that as they start, as the sanguine people start becoming, um, start overcoming the sanguine disposition, they'll start becoming a bit choleric. In other words, they'll get the, the bad traits of the sanguine disposition controlled. But in the, pro- okay, so they get the, the concupiscible appetite under control, but then all of a sudden they realize, well, the irascible appetite is in control. That's just a sign they haven't developed the virtue here because most sanguine people aren't irascible, so it's a case of virtue in the absence of vice, and by for that means they really don't have the virtue. So in other words, they don't get very irascible, so they tend to think, well, I've got meekness down, but they don't really. It's just that they don't react on that level. They tend to react on the concupiscible level. 
so as they overcome, the, you know, they'll overcome things that pertain to the Sixth Commandment. They'll, you know, in other words, they gain a certain level of chastity and a certain level of temperance. And then the next thing you know, they're very choleric and angry. So then they have to kind of work through that process. Um, and then as a person starts overcoming the choleric side, they go through the melancholic. In the process of, of, of developing virtue and a large degree of detachment, one of the things that can happen is people can start suffering from a bit of phlegmatic disposition where, you know, they get to the point where they just don't react at all to anything. And that's not, for that, that's not where the perfection lies either. So the perfection lies in having the characteristics of all of them as to the positive traits and the, none of the characteristics that are negative. Okay. Any questions? This colleague, is he a, is that type of person up on a, Extrovert or introvert? He's usually a bit extroverted. Extrovert. A bit. Maybe in a melancholy and fight my anger, they tend to be introverted. Introverted, yeah. So that's one of the ways that you can kind of size it up. And like I said, if you can kind of figure out where you're at in this, this whole thing, it can tell you a lot about where you're at spiritually. You know, because again, most people develop their spiritual life based upon their disposition. So the sanguine individual will work on charity and things like that because they're very pleasant and it comes easy to them. But they won't work on things like chastity and things of that sort. Um, you know, and so that's, or the cleric person will, you know, champion the fact that he's very fortitudinous, but he hasn't mastered, um, you know, his anger and things of that sort. So. Yeah. How much of our mix of temperaments is genetic, do you think? Uh, well, I mentioned in the beginning, it's, it's largely hereditary. It's the initial temperament that you get is from your parents. But then you can do uh, environmental factors, like the kinds of foods you eat and things like that. So, for example, they're finding that if you feed a kid, the average kid, or a kid who's a bit, uh, has a certain disposition towards it, if you feed him a lot of refined flour and sugars, the kid is going to end up ADD pretty quick. So what you do is you cut him off of certain environmental things, in the food or certain other things, and he'll tend to calm down. But the environmental things can affect, can agitate our emotions, and then they can inflame the confusable and rascal appetites, cause changes in our dispositions of environmental factors. But it's also the choices you make, because this means ultimately you can change your disposition or your temperament on the choices you make based upon the development of virtue or vice. And so... Um, like, for instance, the term personality is a composite thing. It's based upon the fact that we have a rational nature. I mean, we say that animals have a personality, but it's not quite the same thing. So we're rational. So the fact that we can actually, um, and to be a person, you actually have to have rationality or intelligence. Um, but it's also, so it's based on the fact that we're rational, but it's also based upon our disposition. So by personality, we usually mean, you know, the general tendency towards people's behavior and how they tend to react. It's based on their disposition. But then it's also based on virtue and vice. And that personality based on virtue and vice, this is what you develop um, volitionally. And then that will, of course, affect your disposition and that type of thing. So... Um, but it's largely, um, it's initially, it's what it's hereditary. This is why you can see a kid, you know, he's one year old. He doesn't have any rational control over anything, but he just tends to act based upon his disposition. And so you can see, you know, one of them, like a sanguine kid, he'll smile a lot and that type of thing, you know. Whereas the choleric kid, he's always walking around, you know, that type of thing. I've seen some, I've met a kid that's phlegmatic. The kid doesn't react to anything. Doesn't ball, doesn't do nothing. Of course, on that level, I suppose it's kind of pleasant, but... Um, he doesn't, there's no reaction of any kind. So if they tend to react along this level. Now, animals can also have these dispositions as well. And you can kind of see that in different breeds of dogs have different dispositions and that type of thing. But um, they don't have the capacity to change their dispositions. We can change their dispositions. You can take a dog that tends to be rather placid and um, sanguine and then just basically treat it awfully and it'll eventually become very choleric. But... Um, it doesn't develop virtue and vice. But the point is, is that it's, lar it's initially hereditary, and then the, f the dispositions, most people, the one they inherit is usually the one they die with because they don't develop virtue. And, but if you develop the virtue, you will change your disposition. So then, it, so then as you get older, you'll either confirm your disposition or you'll overcome it or change it. Now, where did you say change your disposition? 
charity. Any, well, what you do is, any of, the virtues. any of the virtues can cause a change in your disposition. So what you do is, well, the virtues that are in accord with your disposition will confirm the positive aspects of that, but you have to work on the virtues that are contrary to your disposition, um, and that will begin to help you to overcome your disposition. But most people don't do that, because it's, like I said, it causes pain. It's difficult to do that type of thing, and most people aren't willing to put in the mental effort to do it. One other quick question. Yeah. This may not make any sense. I'm going to ask it anyway. Does, does the temperament reside in the will? Mm-hmm. It's in the body. The will is complete, a completely immaterial faculty. The temperament, the temperament is the disposition. Disposition, is, again, is just how the matter is arranged in our body. So, and that arrangement of the matter determines how well things move. And that's the thing they're, they're finding on. When they first came out with genetics, they thought all this stuff was ironclad, but they're starting to find out that you can actually change your DNA structure by your behavior. So one of the things they've discovered is that you can change your DNA by exercise. So the point being is, is that you can, some, of the, some of the arrangement of the matter is predetermined. You can't. There's not, I mean, you're not going to be able to change some of it, but some of it can be changed. And so it's principally in the body. And then... The faculties and operating through it will either operate well or easily in relationship to various things based upon that disposition. So you have a mother that say silent and the father that's colored. The kid probably would be, be both, wouldn't they? Possibly, yeah. Although sometimes you know genetics, genetics are strange. You know, you can you can have some, you can. I, I mean, I've seen parents who were both very choleric and they have this totally phlegmatic kid. So it, sometimes you just, <laughs> it's, you, you never know. Usually the inheritance we get, like, usually we inherit a certain degree of it from our parents. So you find, you know, you see the, you see the father and the mother, you know, they're very sanguine, so they tend to be very corpulent, they love food, they enjoy the convivial life, and then the kid next to them, the, you know, the next kid, well, he's kind of corpulent too because he loves food, he likes this. So some of that can be their upbringing, but some of it is just the fact that they, they, they inherited the disposition, especially in the stuff that's really predominant. They'll usually um, receive at least some of it. You mentioned numb and, and recessive early. Yeah. What was that in relation to? To the, to the temperaments or disposition. You're going to have one that's dominant. So, uh, like in my own particular case, when I was younger, I have yet to figure out what it is at this stage. But uh, actually, I kind of do. It's changing again. But the, the I used to be very sad, almost just a, just a titch of choleric. I have a friend of mine who's choleric with a bit of melancholy. So, if he's not angry, he's depressed. So, it's one of those kinds of things. And I think as he gets older... He's probably taking on, because he's growing in virtue, he's, he is working hard to overcome his anger, and people who are tend to complain a lot. Same when people tend to complain a lot because if they suffer, if they don't suffer, they don't complain. Um, but he's becoming a bit more melancholic, I think, as we get older, as he gets older. But that's, again, once you overcome the predominant one, then you've got to start working on the stuff that pertains to the recessive. That gives away a connection, though, to the DNA and genetics. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It explains a large the hereditary side of it explains a lot of it in the beginning, but what you ultimately become later is largely due to your own choices. So you know people say their parents, oh, it's my parents' fault. Well, sorry, you're responsible for your own mess at this age. You know, and you used to see that especially when the hippies were growing up, you know. They would say, you know, well, I'm all messed up because of my parents. No, you're messed up because you're smoking marijuana. <laughs> you know, this, you know, they, there's, it's just, it's anything to blame anybody else. Yeah, I got one more. Yeah. Um, if you happen to be a silent and then you have a rough time on it, could you end up being melancholic? Yes, you can. Or you can also become very choleric. Usually, people who are sanguine will shift more towards the cleric, unless the type of, if, if it's the type of difficulties that they, they struggle against and they think they can overcome, and that type of thing will become more cleric, or if it's the type of thing they just get beat around and they just can't do anything, then it'll become more melancholic. But um, again, a lot of that depends too on how you, because how you, 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 you can choose to determine how you're going to react to things to a certain degree, and so you can fight against the... the the negative sides of the of devel- developing the negative aspects of the other temperaments, which is important. And you know, you see this too. You know, people will you can you can get a if you know these really well, 
you can usually pick people, you can usually tell, you know, when the, especially when stuff is rather pronounced, you know, that, you know, this guy, he suffers from um, sins against the Sixth Commandment, which is a sign he's probably very sanguine. Um, so, and so you can kind of, you can base some advice based upon that, but uh, um, for your own benefit, knowing this will help you to know, okay, this is what you've got to work on, or this is the things you have to avoid. So, because he'd be very sanguine, though, and he'd get himself into a lot of trouble because he gets into bad cup or something like that. Yeah. It's the wrong thing. He could become melancholy and look at everything that happened. Be- yeah, that's true. Um, the sanguine disposition appears, at least to me, to be the one that's the most easily changed. The phlegmatic, the most difficult, um, and then choleric, probably. Yeah, it's probably this progression, starting from the easiest to the most difficult to change. Principally because here there's no motivation. Here, the, the faculties just remain depressed, and it's hard to lift the per- person, hard, it's hard to lift himself up by the bootstraps. And the cleric is a little bit more difficult because of the fact that, you know, because of the anger. Um, anger tends to make us think that, well, you know, what I'm doing is righteous, you know. This person has committed this injustice against me. So it's a little bit. Whereas the sanguine, the sanguine individual, he, if he can, if the sanguine individual can conquer impurity and intemperance with regard to food, he'll master pretty much everything fairly quickly. But usually they don't. They don't do that, and that's the problem. And so you know, one of the ways that you tend to see a change in disposition, partly due to environmental factors, is you know, like. Um, uh, and I, guys can go through the same thing, so I'm not trying to single out women here, but you'll see a woman gets married and she can be very sanguine, and that means she's looking for certain delights and that type of thing within the context of the marriage, which makes her very pleasant to her husband when they first marry. But then as he doesn't fulfill every desire and delight of hers, she can very easily degenerate into a choleric disposition. So you'll find women who... And this is something I've kind of noticed. You'll find women who are in their late, later in life, and they're very angry. And then you find out when they, you know, they'll ask them, you know, why did you marry her? And she wasn't like this when we got married. So that's something that uh, can be, uh, you know, kind of a sign. And usually what you do is, you know, in a case like that, is the person who's become very choleric hasn't overcome certain aspects of the sanguinity. That is, their attachment to delights and things of that sort. So once they break those, then very often they'll find they're much more placid. So, Okay. Any other questions? All right, if you kneel, I'll give you a blessing. Benedictio de omnipotentis, patris et filii, et spiritus et supervos et maniat semper. Amen.